Thank you. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5050 in the name of Bruce Crawford on Stirling University's 50th anniversary. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Could I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Bruce Crawford to open the debate. Mr Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I first of all, as done traditionally, can I thank members from all parties who signed the motion and those who are here this evening, and particularly those who are alumni, who I know who, some of them may be speaking this evening as well of, of, from Stirling University. And I, I'm delighted to welcome also Jerry McCormack, who is the principal at Stirling University th this evening to the public gallery. He leads that organisation with a plum and distinction that he's done so since 2010, Jerry. On the 18th September 1967, the doors to the University of Stirling opened for the very first time, admitting 195 students, 164 graduates and 31 postgraduates. It was the first genuinely new university in Scotland for 400 years. With the Royal Charter signed in November 67 and the Great Seal of Scotland applied the following month, Stirling's own university grew to become a global player in educational excellence. And I'm delighted to lead this debate this evening, highlighting the significant history and achievements of this wonderful institution. The debate also gives us the opportunity to consider the massive contribution that the university makes to education, culture and research. President Officer, the university is a truly beautiful campus, offering a fantastic base to visit one of the world's most inspiring and vibrant countries. The university is currently investing an additional £40 million to enhance student residencies. Now, the first ever principal at the university was Professor Tom Cottrell, who also happened to be the co-founder of the university, as well as the co-founder of the McRobert Arts Centre in Stirling, which, like the university, is a thriving institution that continues to inspire to this day. Professor Cottrell's background was in chemistry, a subject he was professor of at Edinburgh University, before coming heavily involved in the formation of the University of Stirling. And I can think of no more fitting an origin story than would help describe the University of Stirling today than that of a, a, a chemistry professor turned founding university principal who dedicated himself to promoting the arts. It's a story that truly sums up the diversity of subjects that are taught on campus, as well as the knowledge that is built on and inspires new generations of students. Now, of course, since opening 50 years ago, the University of Stirling has grown and expanded to offer an increasing number of opportunities to its students. For instance, the University's contribution to sport is almost unrivalled. Named Scotland's University of Sporting Excellence, it, num it offers a number of world-class world health sciences and sporting courses. The recent and perhaps most notable achievement in sport for the University have come from the continuing success of the swimming team. At last year's Olympics in Rio, the University was Scotland's best performer, with the swimming team taking home three silver medals. Stirling swimmers Duncan Scott and Robbie Rennick were part of a GP squad who sealed Olympic silver in the 4x200 freestyle relay. The team achieved the best result in 108 years, setting a new UK record. And Duncan Scott went on himself to smash the UK record in the 100m freestyle. However, as you might imagine, a university as diverse as Stirling has tallied up an impressive number of achievements across a large number of subject fields. Stirling's University and Institute of Aquaculture opened in 1991 and to this day is the largest institution of its kind anywhere in the world. The university's Innovation Park first opened in 1986 and continues to provide a hub for enterprise and business involved directly in research and development and benefits from EU funding. The Irish Murdoch Building, opened by Dame Judy Dench in 2002, is today home to the world-leading Dementia Services Development Centre, an incredibly important focal point for an ageing population with an increasing number of people and families who are facing such a debilitating condition. And following £11.5 million pounds investment, the university opened its new state-of-the-art library in 2011, giving students access 
to modern learning resources and ensuring that all students have the tools they need to succeed in their chosen courses. And today, the University of Stirling is ranked first in Scotland and third in the whole of the UK for graduate employment. Earlier this year, it was named in the top 50 universities in the world under the age of 50. And three quarters of all the research conducted by the university was ranked world leading in the research excellence framework that was carried out in 2014. The Inter International Student Barometer placed Stirling's University first in Scotland for welcoming students from around the world. And in the latest university guide from The Guardian, this marvellous institution was ranked first in criminology, education, media and film, as well as social policy and ranked second for sociology. It shows you this university has a quite remarkable track record. And I wish this debate provided more time to talk about the university's achievements, because there is much more to say. Now, there are more than 82,000 alumni at, of the University of Stirling, consisting of from 169 nationalities. Many of them gone on to serve with distinction in many fields. And today, 14,000 students currently attend the university with 20% of those coming from overseas. With the 1,500 staff included, there are over 120 different nationalities represented on campus today. In its relatively short 50 years, the University of Stirling has grown to become an institution that offers education and life experience opportunities to thousands of people from all walks of life around the globe. Presiding officer, in closing, when preparing for this debate today, I asked the staff at the University of Stirling to sum up their ethos and what the university is about. They responded to me with this. Stirling staff, students and alumni challenge the status quo and make significant difference to society. We are driven by transformative thinking, innovative action and the desire to use our knowledge and skills to help shape the world in a positive way. President Officer, I think I'll just leave the last words to them because they're both powerful and meaningful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Crawford. Open debate, I call Richard Lockhead to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr. Lockhead, please. Uh, firstly, can I congratulate Bruce Crawford on securing this debate? And I suspect the University of Stirling want to bottle his speech. They could make it at the heart of their marketing strategy because they summed up all the many fantastic attributes the university have. And of course, I should also say warm congratulations to the University of Stirling on their 50th anniversary. And I do speak as one of the 82,000 alumni. And I want to give a few personal insights to my alma mater um, as I proceed over the next two or three minutes because the person that stands before you, of course, was shaped by my time at the University of Stirling largely and it certainly enriched me as a person. It was the first time I'd left home to live elsewhere, and of course I was also the first person in my family to go to university. I'd never met anyone in my family who'd ever gone to university. So it was a big move for me, and it was an enriching experience, and of course it's shaped my outlook in life, and I've got many, many fond memories of my time at the university. Uh, first and foremost, as Bruce Crawford mentioned, the outstanding uh, location, and the beautiful surroundings at the university, which is the first things that strike you when you go to the campus. And that does add to the learning experience and as your time as a young person at the university. And I spent many a, a time lying in the grass staring at the stars. I'm not quite sure if the stars were induced by the alcohol I consumed at the Ganache or the Meadow Park Hotel, but the, it was just an amazing environment to walk through every night to go back to your halls of residence. Uh, and of course, the education that takes place there in terms of tutorials and your degree is exceptionally important, but it's all part of the wider education you receive when you go to the University of Stirling or indeed any university in terms of the other cultures you encounter. Stirling is a very international university, as has been mentioned. The Japanese contingent who were there when I was there, there was many Norwegians, and of course a huge contingent from Northern Ireland uh, also, and I got to meet people from all of those countries, and that opens your eyes to what's out there in the big world and all the diverse cultures. Uh, and in terms of the education itself, 
Clearly, there are some specialisms that have been developed at university over time. And when I was Cabinet Secretary for nine years in the Scottish Government, I was responsible for aquaculture, amongst many of my other responsibilities. And the University of Stirling is, of course, the foremost uh, centre of knowledge on aquaculture, which is very appropriate for that to be in Scotland, given that we are the biggest aquaculture producer in the whole of Europe. And I recall visiting the university uh, as Cabinet Secretary and discussing some of the key issues with the staff there. Indeed, I think there's actually a plaque that I unveiled in the Pathfoot building, so hopefully it's still there as well. Uh, so the University of Stirling certainly made its mark in terms of aquaculture and many other disciplines as well. There's not enough time to go through them all here. Uh, Bruce Crawford mentions many of them uh, also. I do think it's important, um, as the university told Bruce Crawford, that the university does challenge the status quo. It's got a reputation for doing that, and I hope it keeps up that reputation. I noticed that there was an article in the news just in the last couple of days where Professor Linda Bald, or Director of the Institute for Social Marketing at the University of Stirling and a Cancer Research UK Cancer Prevention Champion, uh, was talking about the need for limits on junk food, for instance, and junk food promotion as a way of combating cancer, which is something I certainly support. So it's good to see the academics at the university speaking out on those sometimes controversial issues and pushing the boundaries of the debate and impacting on public policy. And I know the principals in the gallery today, and I welcome him to the gallery and I hope he takes away that message that's really important the academics uh, and the university continue to challenge the status quo. Finally I just want to talk about the fact that my, my sense of national identity was also strengthened at uh, my time at university because of course the University of Stirling is steeped in history uh, and Stirling itself is steeped in history and it's in the shadow of the Walsh Monument, you've got Bannockburn close by at the same time. And I was a young member of the SNP whilst I was at the University of Stirling and I started off the Politics Society at the University and I also helped run the Federation of Student Nationalists while I was at the University of Stirling as well. And Dr Robert McIntyre lived in Stirling at the time, the late Dr Robert McIntyre, who was the SNP's first MP elected in the by-election in 1945 and I got to know him when I was at Stirling. So that certainly enriched my knowledge of Scottish political history uh, and the SNP's legacy as well. And he invited me back to his home and his wife served me with sandwiches and coffee whilst he told me about his time in the House of Commons as the SNP's first MP back in 1945. And I'll always, forget, uh, I'll always remember that experience uh, and never forget it. So I do congratulate the university on its 50th anniversary. And I wish you all the best for the next 50 years as well. Continue to make your mark on Scottish education. Continue to ensure that people of all abilities go to university. I know that's a strength of university. And that was one reason why I was able to go to the University of Stirling as well. So here's the next 50 years. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Stewart, followed by Claire Baker. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Very grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the debate this evening. And can I congratulate Bruce Crawford uh, on bringing this member's debate to us this evening. In 2017, the University of Stirling will mark its 50 years since its foundation. And as you've heard already this evening, it now has over 14,000 students uh, and has 1,500 staff. Uh, a huge employer and a huge contribution uh, to the economy uh, in Stirling. To celebrate its past, its present and its future, there are many events planned throughout 2017, with public lectures, exhibitions, family fun days, reunions and much, much more. I welcome these events because it gives the opportunity for the university to engage with the community and gives individuals the chance to celebrate the successes and the anniversary. On the 17th of July 1964, it was announced that Stirling would be the site of the university following on from the Robinson Report in 1963, which highlighted proposals for a new university in Scotland. Uh, and in June 1965, the first appointment uh, for their principal and their vice-chancellor took place. Precisely 50 years ago this month, the new Pathfoot building welcomed its first intake uh, with, in 1968, seeing Stirling University uh, confer degrees on its first cohorts of students. Since 1968, when Stirling University celebrated, uh, a small number of alumni uh, took part in a graduation ceremony. And now we've heard that there are over 80,000 uh, individuals from 169 different countries. Deputy Presiding Officer, one of these highly notable uh, graduates is our own Clerk and Chief Executive of the Scottish Parliament, uh, Sir Paul Grice. He has uh, uh, been uh, 
honoured, as you know, uh, for his services to this Parliament and to higher education uh, and to Scotland as the community. Indeed, Stirling University's alumni are regarded across the world. Uh, and an example of this is to take place uh, uh, in October, uh, where, as part of the anniversary, celebrations will be held in the British High Commissioner's residence in Singapore, hosted by the, the High Commissioner uh, and the Principal Vice-Chancellor of the University will be present. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to take this opportunity not only to congratulate Stirling University on its anniversary uh, and relative short but uh, illustrious history, but also look at some of the outstanding achievements that they've gained throughout the time. In 1979, uh, in 90, sorry, in 1997, the university launched its unique master's degree in palliative nursing care in conjunction with Marie Curie Cancer Care, a fantastic uh, uh, achievement. Uh, and in 2009-10, uh, the, the Sunday Times recognised the outstanding student experience uh, recorded at the university and the quality of teaching that was experienced. In 2014, uh, it, it, it the, the framework uh, of their research uh, was recognised and the university reached into the top 40 and was fifth uh, in, in Scotland for that. And as has we already have heard, uh, it is well ranked in the UK uh, for employability. In 2016, uh, it, the management school programme gained uh, the accreditation of the Association of Master and Business Administration. So, Lots have been achieved uh, over the 50 years that we've seen. Uh, but to conclude, you know, it already has uh, been talked about how the sporting activities that take place at Stirling University, and uh, as Bruce already indicated in his speech, uh, in 2016, the Rio Olympics, they saw uh, three members receive three silver medals. Uh, and a student won a gold uh, for the tennis in the Paralympics uh, as well. So, as I say, Deputy President Officer, I congratulate all who have contributed to the support of the university and I wish them well for their prospects for the future. It's located in a fantastic uh, a site uh, uh, and has uh, the, the fantastic opportunity of, of fitting into that, that, that part of Scotland uh, in the very centre. Uh, and as I say, and I look forward to attending many of the celebrations and will support all I can to ensure that the university is given the recognition and respect that it deserves. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call Claire Baker to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Ms Baker, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am delighted to take part in this evening's debate celebrating Stirling University's 50th anniversary, and I would like to thank Bruce Crawford for his motion enabling the debate to go forward. It is a pleasure to recognise the growth of Stirling University. In 1967, it was the first university in Scotland for over 400 years, and one which offers a unique campus experience in Scotland. It is a beautiful university to visit. It is situated within a 330-acre estate and it is designed around a loch and the 18th century Eartha Castle. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend a week there at a conference when I was a postgraduate student and it's fair to say I spent more time in the social areas than I did enjoying the natural landscape. But as one of the MSPs for the area, it is always a pleasure to visit the campus throughout the seasons and admire its location. It has won many awards and merits for its campus environment. The establishment of Stirling University was part of an expansion in higher education across the UK during the 1960s. Um, at the time, the country faced an increasingly young population. The number of full-time students in higher education doubled throughout the 1960s. There were rising expectations of better qualified school leaders who had stayed at school longer, and a growing belief that investment in higher education was a means of procuring national prosperity. All this saw a number of new universities established. And while they were created to cope with an increase in student numbers, they were also seen as a way of injecting some fresh thinking into the university system. These universities played an insignificant part in expanding opportunities for more people to go to university, often the first person in their family to have access to that level of education. Stirling has always been an outward-looking, innovative university. Perhaps not weighted with the expectations or traditions of the ancient universities, it was free to create a modern identity, one which valued its students, was open to working with others and sought to make a difference. Always high related for the student experience, and I note that a number of MSPs are graduates, alumni include John Reid, now Baron Reid of Cargown, who described his time as a Stirling student. He said, 
you have a vital community with critical thought, mental rigour and an environment second to none. Just walk around the place. Why would you want to go to any other university in the world? It is also more than a university. The location of the McRoberts Art Centre is hugely advantageous to the university and students, as well as a huge benefit for the area. The expansion in recent years in sports facilities with the designation of Stirling as Scotland's University for Sporting Excellence provides excellent opportunities to competitive athletes as well as students. The openness of the university to the local community is important to its identity and it is one of its real strengths. Stirling University also has a good track record in working with many partners locally and internationally. They have a breadth of researchers who produce excellent work with external organisations in the private, the public and the voluntary sector. Just last week I went to the parliamentary discussion of the Good Life in Later Years report. This is a research project carried out by community research teams of older people supported by the University of Stirling and Age Scotland and was funded by the Life Changes Trust. It's a really good example of the type of research undertaken by Stirling which makes an important contribution to the public policy agenda. Stirling is one of the UK's leading research universities in the fields of health and well-being, the environment and people, culture and society, enterprise and the economy and sport. Um, I want to wish Stirling University, all the students, some of whom are just starting out on their academic journey this week, and all the staff who work on the campus, the very best on this special anniversary, one which recognises a real landmark in the university's life, and I wish them many successful years ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Mr. Ruskell, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Bruce Crawford for bringing forward this motion um, for debate and hearty you know, congratulations to Jerry and all the university staff and everybody who's contributed to the success of Stirling University over the last uh, 50 years. Um, I'll also declare an interest as a, an, an alumnus of Stirling University. Um, I was there at the same time as uh, Richard Lockhead. In fact, he may be doesn't remember, but we were engaged in a poster war uh, at that time between SNP and the Greens. Maybe he doesn't know it was me It was ripping down his posters, I don't know. But, you know, there was a strong tradition of politics at Stirling, and of course, for, former First Minister Jack McConnell was uh, a student president at Stirling as well. Um, and then when I went on to become a councillor, I had the, um, the pleasure of having the campus in my, in my council ward as well. And over the, the years, I've met and worked with many generations of people uh, who've studied um, and worked at Stirling University. I've met some of the original students from 67 right through to today's students that will be starting back um, this week. And I think there are many common experiences that we all have of, of being at Stirling University. One which uh, Richard has already mentioned is, is that the campus is a really inspiring environment to work and study. And there's something quite intense about having hundreds, if not thousands of young people in a campus. But that's counterposed beautifully by the nature of the environment and the calmness of Airthry Loch, the Hermitage Woods. And I think despite the fact that we've seen many expansions to the campus, very welcomed expansions over the years, including the building of the National Tennis Centre, it's always managed to um, keep the integrity uh, of its natural environment and keep that balance, which I think is really important. And there are still really important features of the campus which echo back to the original uh, Airthry estate which has been retained and I think that's a great great tribute to the way the university's estates and uh, management department have managed to expand it over time. Um, I, I think the other um, sort of common experience that we have is just the diversity uh, of Stirling University. It was the first time I'd been to a university meeting so many people from different backgrounds and different places and like Richard I was the first person in my family um, to go to university and I think you know that's really true to the vision of Robbins from 63 that the, the new universities were about ability and attainment not about background and I think perhaps because of that um, Stirling has always attracted a little bit of a radical strain of politics and activism right the way through from the 1960s to the present day and I can remember my own time at Stirling getting involved in campus campaigns issues from dropping third world debt to recycling and the greens and everything else I probably shaved a grade off my final degree as a result but what I gained in terms of experience um, was hugely important and it's that well-rounded nature of uh, your experience at university which is so important and that international nature of the university the diversity of the students there has only grown over time and it's, it's a triumph to see 120 nationalities now 
represented studying and working on the campus. And of course, the, the university's won awards for, for that as being the most welcoming university in Scotland for international students. And I think, presiding officer, there's an important point here about Brexit, that we need to see free movement of students across the world, those 120 nationalities, to come to Stirling to study and to stay and also to contribute to those wider communities. And I think, um, you know, if we look at the successful places around the world, if we look at the flotilla of small cities that exist around the world, places like Tübingen, for example, in Germany, cities that are low-carbon, innovative, outward-looking, smart, and economically incredibly successful, the reasons why they're successful is because they've got strong links to strong universities. So I do think, in, in concluding, presiding officer, that there is a real opportunity for Stirling University to play a central role in Stirling and Clap Manager's City deal, perhaps even more of a central role in that deal going forward, driving innovation and excellence, but in a way that also addresses some of the sharp inequalities that exist in the surrounding communities in Stirling. And I think that would be a great legacy that's true to Robin's original vision of inclusion and the founding principles that we saw of Stirling 50 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by the Minister. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank Bruce Crawford for bringing this motion to the Chamber today uh, and giving us the opportunity to celebrate the University of Stirling's 50th anniversary. I also extend my own warm, warm welcome to Principal McCormack. As Bruce Crawford and others have mentioned, only a handful of students were enrolled when the university first opened its doors in September 1967. Since then, it has grown in size and reputation to become a centre of excellence in academics, research and innovation, and for producing graduates that are sought after by employers of all sizes and in all sectors and locations. Indeed, the quality of education provided by the university is clearly demonstrated by the remarkable success of its graduates. In addition to the notable alumni, so many mentioned today, uh, that others have uh, quite rightly highlighted, the university is ranked first in Scotland and third in the UK for graduate employability, with 97% of graduates being in employment or further study this year. Quite a remarkable endorsement of the quality of teaching and education provided by the university. Uh, the university, however, rightly pr pr prides itself in its ability to combine this excellence in training with excellence in research and innovation. In particular, the university has an outstanding track record for research and innovation in several specialist areas, including the fields of aquaculture, as has been mentioned, dementia, and the environment, to name but a few. In the area of aquaculture, as we've heard, the university is home to the Institute of Aquaculture, a leading international centre in this field and the largest of its kind in the world. With a community of 350 highly skilled staff and students from around the world, uh, this institute brings world-class researchers from a variety of disciplines to focus on some critical questions facing not just this country, but the world today. How to support communities in developing countries so they have to, enough to eat, how to develop strategies for sustainable aquaculture and aquatic food security. I'm sure you'll agree some uh, really important questions being addressed by the Institute and the University. Uh, since its formation, the Institute has grown steadily. Ye yes, indeed. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Dean Lockhart. Let, let me make a quick intervention. It allows me to make right an omission I should have made at the beginning. And thank you for doing that. I should have mentioned, of course, the university is not actually in my constituency. It's in the constituency of my good friend Keith Brown, MSP, who's also here this evening. And I should have made that point at the beginning. So thank you very much for allowing me to intervene to make sure I got that on the record. You're now back in the Cabinet Secretary's good books. Okay. Mr Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Crawford. And I, I welcome Mr Brown uh, to this uh, debate as well. I was highlighting the global engagement and international reach, uh, reach of the university, and I think this is something that uh, plays out across a lot of different areas and a lot of um, features of what the university does. The global reach is shown by the fact that it has uh, international students from over uh, 120 countries represented on uh, campus, with more than 82,000 alumni from 150 different countries, and that's only set to continue after this week's fresher week. And I'm sure we can all remember uh, the first time we uh, attended university or another institution and the warm welcome that uh, occasions like Freshers' Week or similar can enjoy. 
The university's international ambitions are also reflected in strategic international partnerships to promote excellence and innovation uh, and teaching with, with global impact. There are partnerships uh, throughout the world, including with institutions in the USA, Australia, Canada, and the Far East through the Study Abroad Program. Uh, the, the university also offers undergraduate degrees uh, to students in Singapore through a partnership with the Singapore Institute of Management. And I've personally met uh, students who uh, attend the SIM and they speak very highly of the courses offered through that joint partnership. As Scottish, uh, Scottish um, higher education continues to provide a world-class offering, I would certainly encourage the university to continue to reach out globally and attract even further and greater numbers of international students to study in Stirling, to get to know the fantastic campus, the city, and the uh, countryside surrounding the university. So let me wrap up again by thanking Bruce Crawford for bringing this debate to the chamber, and I would like to wish the university all the best as it enters another 50 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Lockhart. I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to close the Government. Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I also begin by thanking Bruce Crawford for bringing this motion to the Chamber, allowing us to reflect on the many achievements of Stirling University. And can I also uh, welcome uh, Principal Jeremy Cormack to the public gallery today. Uh, Bruce Crawford and other members have rightly pointed to the beautiful uh, campus set in an absolutely stunning uh, setting. It is, I think, quite a, a unique uh, university in, in many aspects, but the campus uh, life is very special. Uh, Claire Baker also pointed out to the the very, very important role of the McBob within the, the, the campus um, too. Something that's not just very important to the university, but also to the local community, tying the university and the local community uh, together in a very, very important way. But the growth of the, the university itself has been absolutely incredible, as other members have pointed out, to go from under 200 students in 1967 to just short of 12,000 in 2015-16 is incredible. We all only have to consider the contribution of its alumni to understand the impact of the university has had on Scotland and further afield. As well as those mentioned within Bruce Crawford's original motion, we have, of course, Ian Banks and Jackie Kay, two of our most well-regarded literary figures in the field of science and innovation, Muffy Calder, and of course in the political world, the University of Stirling can count ministers, cabinet secretaries, and even former first ministers amongst um, its graduates. Of course, we can also point to many um, MSPs in the chamber who are uh, alumni. Uh, Richard Lockhead has, has uh, pointed out uh, his experiences uh, within uh, the, the campus, uh, both as a student and as a minister. And I think there will be many ministers that will attend uh, different visits uh, to the university campus, attesting to the, the wide range of specialisms uh, that the university um, has within, its, uh, within the campus, whether that's uh, aquaculture or dementia, two of which have been mentioned. I can only uh, hope to reach the dizzy heights of a plaque in the Pathfoot building, um, however, which is um, uh, an impressive um, feat for, for Mr Lockhead. And Mark Ruskell, of course, has pointed to poster wars. We can forget that for our days all in student politics. I'm intrigued to know between Mark Ruskell and Richard Lockhead who won poster wars. Uh, I, think it may have been, uh, I think it may have been Mr Lockhead. Uh, but he does, um, on a more serious point, Mark Ruskell did point to the diversity within the university, which is exceptionally important. The different backgrounds that we come together in, whether it's people who have never been to university before or the different nationalities that we have. 120 nationalities uh, currently within the university is something which that institution can be very proud of. The internationalism which our higher education institutions uh, have is something which makes them one of the, the most respected institutions across uh, the globe. That is, as uh, Mark Ruskell has pointed out, unfortunately under threat uh, from Brexit as we see a drop in the EU applications coming forward from students and of course the lack of a post-study work visa for international students as well. Both of those would help uh, this university and others to increase their international standing. But the role of the universities has never been more important. As the First Minister said when introducing the programme for government, we want Scotland to be the best place in the world to bring up children, the best place to grow up and be educated, to live, work, visit and invest. 
So ensuring that we have a highly educated and skilled population able to meet the needs of a rapidly changing economy is vital for our future prosperity and for our well-being. And that's why improving education is this government's number one priority. And Sterling's contribution to that is absolutely marked. It has an impressive record on widening access and will continue to do so. I was delighted to see the appointment of a new Director of Admissions and Access to oversee the projects which the University um, has, further embracing, as many people have already spoken about in the Chamber today, the ability for universities to attract the first of a family to come to such an institution. That is something which I'm sure will grow and grow. The links to the colleges is also exceptionally important and something which uh, Stirling University can be exceptionally proud of. Its links with Forth Valley College and its full articulation is something which has highly impressed me on my ministerial visits. I was recently at Forth Valley College uh, campus in Stirling uh, where members of the university were talking about the learner journey, working hand in hand with employers and colleges to ensure that they're delivering for students in the local area and further afield. And I'm delighted to see that commitment coming from both the college and the university within Forth Valley. And of course, the recent HESA stats have showed that the university continues to be very successful in terms of employment outcomes for graduates. Clearly, they are getting something very right in terms of the quality, the relevance, and the modernity of its teaching and its research. Bruce Crawford also pointed rightly to the university's uh, sporting excellence. It designated, of course, as the University of Sporting Excellence in 2008, it's clear that whether studying or participating, sport is very much at the heart of the university's admission. It is at this point, I suppose, as alumni of the University of Stirling, I would have to admit that my first visit to the uh, sports area within the university was on a ministerial visit. I managed within my two years at Stirling University uh, not to, uh, to, to visit the sports centre um, at all. I would like to claim I was in the library most of that time, presiding officer, but perhaps in the student union um, um, specialising in uh, student politics in my party's youth wing. But nevertheless, delighted to see that the sporting excellence of uh, the university is marked um, whether I went or not. Many contributions have pointed to the number of awards and recognition which the University of Stirling has, its strong performance in the university rankings, um, whether it's the Times Higher Education World University rankings or the Sunday Times Good University Guide 2017, no doubt due to its fantastic record within teaching research excellence. And a closing, presiding officer, um, as uh, someone who studied at university, uh, or the University of Stirling for two years myself and had a, a very happy uh, two years um, as a postgraduate student there, um, I know and the other colleagues who are in the chamber today uh, who have also studied or indeed uh, worked within the university are confident that the institution will build on the history that we're celebrating today. And I'm sure we will be back in the chamber in years to come to celebrate further success. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes this debate and I close this meeting with Parliament.